more than half of the Americans have perio. And it's such a prevalent disease that people don't know about. So when we get the first line, you know, we can teach the, the students exactly what they're looking for and how to talk to their patients. We're making a bigger difference than just when we see our own patient. I kind of feel like I put myself through my own perio intensive boot camp because obviously I graduated nearly 23 years ago. So science has definitely changed since then. So we always have to keep pushing forward. I think it's so important to learn along with our students and to, you know, be okay with not knowing everything. Sometimes um, my best days in clinic are when my students teach me something because sometimes they think of something that I wouldn't have thought of. And I think that's amazing. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast Gygenist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, episode number 269. Everybody, this is your student roundtable for this month, the month of uh, March. There we are. We're in March this year, um, 2021. So thank you so much, everyone, who has been a part of this amazing Walk for Charity that we're doing Thank you so much for submitting uh, groups. We have finalized the five groups that we're going to donate the charity to. So make sure you're following us on social media so you can see which groups they are. We're also still looking for if you've been interested and you want to participate, $5 for every mile that that I walk is what we're looking for. And if you can uh, sponsor one of the miles, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much, my friend, Jerry. Jerry, we go back several years now. She's been one of the most supportive women in my life. She's always uh, happy-go-lucky, positive. She sent me the most amazing milestone stickers for every huge milestone. And so we're still putting together of how we're going to demonstrate that or put that out there for everyone to look at. But thank you, Jerry. You're just amazing. I also want to thank everybody that has shared our episode on the COVID vaccine. It was an interesting episode, and I think that it was so informative for debunking a lot of the thought processes that are out there. And I know that we've we've heard so many positive, and we're grateful that we actually haven't heard any negative feedback. And I'm not soliciting, please don't send me any negative feedback about it. But thank you for sharing it. Uh, Dr. Rooker is one of my favorite doctors that I worked with for, for several years. And uh, I know that he shared it with his staff. I just think that that is uh, true leadership right there when you are, and he's doing something really special for his staff too. I, I don't want to talk about, it. I don't want to blow his his brain up too much about how wonderful he is, but he is truly a leader in, in his office. He wants what's best for his patients and he's really pushing to have his professionals in his office next to him be as informed as possible. So thank you for him. Thank you for everyone else that has uh, shared that message. So in this interview that we have for you today, we actually have several roundtable panelists that are educators on perio. Now, if you're like me and you're like, oh, perio, woof, then I want you to still stay in this because it actually got really, really interesting. I had several different different types of questions that I want to talk to them. We didn't get into the science of perio. We didn't talk about biofilm management or any of those things. But I wanted to really have, if you are a student listening to this, I wanted you to have like a front row seat to the to inside the brain of those instructors, because I think that when you really understand where they're coming from and what they're trying to accomplish, then it's really going to help. And I know I said this on the episode, but myself as someone who is recruiting hygienists, there's definitely a caliber of hygienists that I'm looking for. And if you are an active learner and are in these really cool programs uh, that that all of these educators are a part of, then you're going to be someone that I'm going to be looking for. I'm going to pay you a pretty decent wage to uh, come work for us. So please be engaged in this episode. And also, please, if you're an educator, have all of your students listening to this episode as well. I think there's a lot of really good information here. So sit back and enjoy this student roundtable focused on Perio. Hey everyone, before we get into the roundtable, I need to give a quick plug for Q-Optics. 
I cannot believe it has been more than a year since Chicago Midwinter of 2020. I remember clearly the day at the conference when we stopped by the Q Optics booth to get measured for loops. And beyond the high quality of their products, I was impressed by their professionalism. If you are a student listening to this podcast or a faculty member looking to help out your students, reach out to our friends over at Q Optics and get them into your program. You have heard on our show many times, we fully support using loops during clinical care and highly recommend investing in the light as well. You'll be happy with that choice. To find out more and see what else they have in store, check out qoptics.com. That's q-optics.com. And now back to the show. Welcome everybody, students and faculty to this special interview portion of the podcast. I'm very excited about today's podcast because these are all educators on Perio, and I don't think I've ever sweated as much as I am right now, thinking back to the days when I was learning all of the Perio. Oh my gosh. I'm so nervous for this, but hopefully you guys will sit back, learn a ton. The reason why I wanted to have this particular episode is because I wanted to break it down a little bit for both students and faculty. I wanted everyone to be on the same page because I feel like those nervous sweats that I was getting is because I didn't really understand how much the faculty actually does care and how much they want me to succeed. And so that's what I'm trying to bring to you today. So hopefully that that's what, what comes out. We have some amazing guests and I want to go one by one and I'll have you guys introduce yourselves. The first one we're going to introduce is a more of a reintroduction. Eva has been on the, the program multiple times. And so Eva, if you don't mind uh, introducing yourself. My name is Eva Ramsey, and um, I'm a full-time educator. I um, am assistant professor at Tennessee Wesleyan University. And Marie? Hi, my name is Marie Ritchie, and I am an assist a full-time educator and assistant professor at Shawnee State University. And Amanda? I'm Amanda Mitchell. I'm a full-time educator. I'm a faculty member at Student RDH, and I teach for South College in Nashville, Tennessee. And Lisa? Hi, I'm Lisa Billick. I'm department chair at Eastern Washington University and taught Perio for 15 years. And I just, throw, I have to throw in, um, I'm also faculty for Andy RDH. He would kill me if I didn't say that. <laughs> oh my gosh. That, how weird is it? We didn't talk about this beforehand. Oh, so lots of different things. Lisa, do you know I'm from Washington State? Yes, I'm uh, Sarah Jackson. It's like, you're just oh, yes. <laughs> I've tried to get Sarah on the podcast, so we'll leave it at that for right now. We won't shame her too much on this one, but happy to have you representing Washington, of course. Also, as a quick side note, all of you, so Eva's been a friend of the show for quite some time, but the rest of you are actually introductions from introductions, which is very, like, we don't know each other personally, which goes, to, I think, to show how amazing the hygiene world is, right? So I reach out to a couple of people and I'm like, hey, I need some guests for this. I literally had a dozen people within two days that could have been on the show. And I'm so thankful, so uh, grateful that you guys are here. I kind of threw the, on this last minute, so I appreciate that. Uh, we're not even gonna get into the whole stuff that how I already took red, I was in red and I was an examiner for CDC or for credits, and now I have to take a CDCA exam. We're not even gonna get in that today, guys, don't you worry. Don't you worry. So, okay, first question, panelists. <clears throat> Why Perio? Why are you in love or and or maybe you're not in love with it, maybe just teach it, but why Perio? Oh, I can take this one. So, um, first of all, I'm a huge nerd. <laughs> um, if you've listened to the podcast for very long, I am a huge nerd. I love science. And to me, Perio is just kind of the the path. Um, where science and dentistry kind of merge. So it's microbiology of the mouth. It's, it's just so much fun. So I love perio because more than half of the Americans have perio. And it's such a prevalent disease that people don't know about. So when we get the first line, you know, we can teach the, the students exactly what they're looking for and how to talk to their patients. We're making a bigger difference than just when we see our own patients. I love perio because I think that is the heart of being a dental hygienist. Even in Washington, where we can do restorative, you still have to know perio. I always feel like an investigator when I was a clinician. So today we talked about the um, microbes and I just, they're like, you just like this too much 
Professor Billy Cummings. <laughs> I love it. I'm a nerd and don't take it away from me, please. Oh, I love it. I have to say that when I was interviewing this summer for a full-time faculty role, both of the schools that I was kind of in the final process with, Peria was on the list of I was going to have to teach it. But I actually have always loved for 20 some years practicing. I love treating my perio patients and scaling and root planning. And my office that I worked at when I was a part time educator could always get me in for like at least a half day of work if they promised me like a uh, uh, like a full mouth, like sedation patient for scaling and root planing, they'd be like, oh, we've got this great case for you. And I'd like, look at the x rays in the chart. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'll come in and do it. Even though, you know, I've got to leave at such and such a time and go teach a class, I would still always do it because I wanted, I just loved it. Going back to what Lisa was saying, um, I always use with my students the house references. So I always tell them that they're disease detectives. I mean, they really get to figure this out. It's a lot of deductive reasoning. And I think that frustrates them a lot because it's not black and white. They have to use a lot of critical thinking skills. But I think that that part of it is fun to them, too. Let me ask you this. So House is notorious for his little differential diagnosis board, right? Do you think that his students now actually understand that reference? Or is this a little bit outdated now? Is House still cool? That's a good question. I think they do know who he is. I do include visual <laughs> references. We did a thing in school. So I went to Yakima Community College and uh, we actually had a presentation that I was house. And I was like this grumpy old rah, 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 and it, it was the best thing ever. I didn't think anyone else really appreciated it except for me, but I thought it was awesome. And then Marie, going back to what you said, and, and even knows this about me. I would go in, like in, in your situation, if they could promise me all the restorative sedation in the world, I'd be like so happy to go in and do fillings all day long. Perio is not my strong suit. It is one of those things that I think because it wasn't black and white, like you guys are talking about, like you had to really understand it to a level that I wasn't myself willing to invest in. Now, I want to talk a little bit about that investment though, because how do you get a student or how do you get a curmudgeon clinician like myself to invest themselves in this ultimately the most important part, I think, of what we do as clinicians? I think really for educators, it's about showing the passion and relating it to their whole career instead of what they do just from day to day. The big difference, the big picture that, you know, the difference they can make in people's lives because we don't clean teeth. We are preventative healthcare specialists. And I think that doesn't click until they realize how involved periodontitis is for their patients and how many other body systems are impacted by their oral health. I think too, being that this is my first year teaching perio, I've had to really dig in to the information one of the things that for me was that I was given a lot of booklets and things like that that had been previously used, but it was in need of a fresh set of eyes and some updating. So I have found that I have really dug in with all the great um, CE trainings that are available right now. And I found that at this point, I really understand, especially the new classifications as far as staging and grading. I really had to dig into that so that I would be kind of the on faculty expert in making sure that everybody was on the same page as far as faculty, part time, full time, as well as getting the students up to speed. So there was a lot of responsibility I felt on me, but I really had to dig in. I kind of feel like I put myself through my own perio intensive boot camp because obviously I graduated nearly 23 years ago. So science has definitely changed since then. So we always have to keep pushing forward. I find if I ask a student about their patient, so first day I ask them, okay, who did you see in clinic today or whenever? And tell me about that patient. And so 
I usually kind of have an inroad because the uh, the clinic lead tells me, hey, you should probably ask the student because they had a good patient. And so it makes it real for them, you know, because perio is such a hard class and they just, and there are days they hate it. Get out of town. That doesn't happen. Oh, I, it was for restorative for me, but... <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, oh, it's, shots fired, Lisa. Shots fired. We're, so, we're on the same team here, I thought, Washington. Come on. I'm just not good at it. So. <laughs> but if you can make it real for the student. So I'm not in clinic as much, but when I do show up, I say, hey, okay, tell me about the gum tissue. What kinds of inflammatory cells do you think is happening? So classification, we know that classification. So why is that? Why do you think... So actually, they hate when I come into clinics. Who so <laughs> ask those questions? But, Make them clinically think. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, that, but it makes it more real for them, and that, like, oh, it's not just about the test. It's about having to know I can stop the process by what I do. Yeah. Um, I think going back to what Marie said is so um, is so important for faculty to be calibrated in terms of periodontology and like what they're being taught and how that's being presented to them in the clinic. It's so important that those two are the same because when they're different, it's a disaster. And I know students are frustrated, faculty are frustrated. So for me, I do um, a yearly kind of faculty update where we actually look at a case together and I try to choose cases that are kind of in that gray area where they can be kind of in maybe two different categories and we kind of present the reason why we chose one over the other. I think that's helpful. You would do that. I would. <laughs> well, I, we weren't going to go down this road, but now you guys have got my brain thinking in a whole different direction than what we kind of templated out. So how does this work then in a school setting where, you know, you have a staging and grading, I guess it's not really all that new now, but it's, you know, it's relatively new, I think by education standards where the idea was put forth several years ago, was it 2017? So that it came out and, um, staging and grading. So then you, you teach this thought and then there has to be now the research and there has to be the implementation of in the school setting. And then you have to try and educate these students of how they're going to implement that in the real world, which if I'm being perfectly honest, when you have something like an EagleSoft, a, a Dentrix, a, a software that doesn't recognize staging and grading because it's not a, it's a diagnosis code, not a treatment code. How does that evolve at the like educator level, at the educator, the institutional level for new thoughts and ideas like staging and grading? I have seen a lot of pushback because a lot of times we are so used to doing it one way. And as faculty, we can look at a set of radiographs and say AAP case type two, AAP case type four without second, you know, a second thought, but then taking into consideration that radiographic bone loss is now more important than clinical attachment loss. And adding all of these different factors that are more important now than they used to be, it's not as easy. It's more time consuming and there's more explanation and work in a diagnosis, in a dental hygiene diagnosis. So putting that all together and then taking into consideration that a faculty doesn't have a hive mind, we're not all thinking the same thing. And our clinical experience and specialties are what we bring to the table and might differ between clinicians and just being respectful of everybody else's clinical experience and their clinical diagnoses. I think that's really important for faculty to recognize and for students to recognize, honestly. It's been especially tough in the time of COVID because we cannot do a in-person faculty in-service that we normally do. So our faculty actually recorded things that we talked about and the classification was one of them. I did do a IDEA webinar, so we do make them listen to it, but we also kind of test them. And then we let the instructors know, you know what, investigate it with students. You know, it's okay not to always be right, but to talk about why you think that is why you think it's not because um, especially our junior students, you know, they're still figuring out the grades and stages They're, you know, they're just, which is fine. You know, they're, they're just starting to see patients. And so I tell the instructors, you know, I say, 
Sometimes I don't know. And how do I, I'm like, okay, what do you think? And why do you think that? Tell me about that. And so it's really important to involve the student and let the student know I'm not a perio god. And so let's, you know, investigate this together and why you think that is the case. Kind of to piggyback on what Lisa said, during the time of COVID, we had cohorts of students who hadn't even seen a patient in person yet. And we're trying to explain clinical attachment loss and stage one and grading and these really critical thinking heavy subjects without having anything in front of them to show that. So it has been really difficult, not only to calibrate, but to teach perio and get them prepared for the real world. I totally agree with Amanda in what she was saying on the fact that our students are not getting as much. Things are moving a little slower due to COVID. And so the engagement with actual patients is a little slower. I'm teaching a first year student's perio right now. And I think pre-COVID, they would have already been working on patients in the general population, but they will in the next two weeks just be starting on completing a partner assessment and sequence of care before they move into an experience on someone outside of our academic realm. So for them, it's been a lot of trying to pull in into the lectures, pictures, radiographs, and any images that I can find to show and demonstrate what we normally would have been seeing on our clinic patients. And with the senior students, I tell them it's really about having the conversation with your instructor when you have that patient in the chair and looking at all the information you have and making your best diagnosis for that day. And I always feel like six months later, four months later with another instructor with a different assessment, it may be a little bit different, but we're still on a good path. Yeah, I think this goes back to um, what a couple of them were saying, but um, I think it's so important to learn along with our students and to you know, be okay with not knowing everything. Sometimes um, my best days in clinic are when my students teach me something because sometimes they think of something that I wouldn't have thought of. And I think that's amazing. I think that you know, as a student, that would have really helped me maybe appreciate my instructors more if they, because I, I do feel that at times my perception of them was they're infallible. They know everything. They are, you know, this and that and the other. And, and like this institution has been set in stone for so long, there's no changing. And that's not true. And I think that they were also learning and growing and experiencing, but I, I wasn't aware of, well, I mean, we never had those types of conversations. And I think that communication between student and faculty is huge. I think that's especially true in this time. You know, I know as faculty during this pandemic, you know, the mental and emotional toll that it's taking on me. I mean, I know that I'm heavily distracted and I have been the entire year. So it's hard for me to focus. I know it's hard for my students to focus. Um, So I think it's just important that we give each other grace and um, we really go out of our way to respect one another right now. I want to change gears a little bit, if that's okay with everyone. And it's funny. I feel like I'm projecting a lot of my, you know, 2007, 2008 feelings on, on everyone. But when we're talking about lesson plans and preparing your lesson plans, there were definitely some educators who I felt were out to make my life incredibly hard and to catch me in something that I didn't know and to put me in my place and things like that. As a like relatively more mature adult now, I, I'm hopeful that that's not true. And I wanted to maybe just get a little glimpse inside each of your brains of as you're creating that lesson plan, like what what is going through your mind as you're trying to create this? I really set each course up and kind of make the plan from the beginning. I plan out kind of my week by week with the topics covered. And then I put my course objectives under that. So what those topics are fulfilling. And then I go through and I have a spot where I put some type of activity that we're going to do. So whether it's something as simple as today, we were talking about vacations. So we were passing around a model that they could explore on with the neighbor's probe. 
and then also a scale that we were testing the pounds uh, or grams of pressure applying. So just trying to something to get their hands on something, even though we're not in clinic, um, and that might be more of a theory thing. So just trying to bring everything together, as well as I always try to figure out if there's something I can do that week to assess their learning and see where they're at. Sometimes it is a test or quiz, but sometimes it's just questions that I will throw out to the group on something that we've covered in the previous um, weeks to make sure that that information is still retained. So I totally agree with what Marie is saying, and I think it's so important to recognize the way that generational differences are in thing our lesson plans. We ha I'm a millennial, and I know everybody is so difficult on the millennials, right? But Gen Z is getting a bad rap now. And rightly so. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yeah. Just kidding. Gen X, they're not taking my skinny jeans. <laughs> yeah, I was told I look old because I had a side part. I was like, oh, oh. So <laughs> I'm not giving up my skinny jeans. It's not happening. Okay, so first, you know, generational differences are huge. The way that we deliver the material, especially in an online format, makes a world of difference. Students are not tuning in for us reading off of slides. They're not tuning in for us lecturing or talking at them. They want interactive activities. Like Marie was saying, they want to hold something. And that is so difficult in the time of COVID. I really like to give them, you know, students have a lot of test anxiety surrounding a midterm that covers 16 chapters and a final exam that covers 30 some chapters. I like to break that up into small quizzes that aren't really worth anything but participation to get them accustomed to reading the questions and figuring out what they need to pull from the question. What is it asking you? And finally, case studies. Case studies are half of the board exam. So by getting them used to working on even just simple case studies during Perio, we can get them more geared toward what they need to be looking at and that critical thinking mindset instead of a memorization mindset. Yeah, I kind of um, try to incorporate a lot of hands-on activities in my course as well. A couple of my favorite projects that my students do is um, they do a mock surgery where they actually will take the gingiva off of the typodont and they have color-coded Play-Doh in which they have to tell me what kind of uh, tissue they used and they have to make certain incisions. And it's a really great way for them to break down the different types of surgeries. And then the other thing, um, students tend to struggle a lot with the immunology chapter in regards to perio. So um, I have them do a mixed media art project where um, they get to use any media that they want. Sometimes they use, this is gonna sound really Southern, but I've had students use shotgun shells, beach shells, you name it, they have probably used it before. And they actually have themes to these assignments. And it's great because when they're taking the exam, they can remember, oh yeah, the fibroblast was this type of thing. So it's just kind of making those connections. And I think it helps them to break down the material in a way that they can remember and understand it. I know the students do think I'm out there torturing them. So they, <laughs> they feel comfortable enough to tell me that. So <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree with all of everyone hands on. And so, because we're on Zoom, I was like, oh my gosh, all the things I normally do. But I gave them a little baggie of Play-Doh, gummy bears, and a hairband. And I said, okay, tell me which one is the healthy tissue, which one is the fibroedematous, which one is the dematous. Okay, now that we figured that out, tell me about the fibers in there, what's going on. And then I, I keep going back to, okay, we had Play-Doh, what kinds of cells do you think we would have? What kinds of, what would the tissue like? And then I like, oh, should have kept that Play-Doh, so. Let me ask you this then, what, like, what is your ultimate outcome? So you're, you're creating these lesson plans, you're trying to be interactive, you're trying to teach to the individuals and kind of make it fun and, and get them to, to learn, but like, what is your ultimate best outcome for these lessons? I think my ultimate outcome for the lesson is that they can take what they learned in the class and apply it to the clinical setting and ultimately have better outcomes for their patient's health. I see you all nodding. I'm assuming you all have very similar answers to that. Go ahead, Lisa. I totally 
agree with Eva because the thing that jazzes me is when the student comes and goes, guess what? I had a patient and they had Play-Doh tissue and this is what happened and this is what I did. And this is, and this is, and so, you know, because they went back to what you said, I mean, it was just that light bulb, but, you know, because when you're sitting on Zoom, I think, are you guys out there? Are you awake? You know, but then they come to me. I am the one that's always on campus. So they run up the stairs and tell me, oh my gosh, I had a Play-Doh patient today. (laughs) I just love the light bulb moment. Like Lisa said, that is what I live for as an educator. And just seeing like that passion ignite and seeing how they can interact with their patients and talk to their patients with a new level of care and understanding it, it makes all the difference. I, that's just my favorite thing about teaching the light bulb moments. And something that I've tried to incorporate in it is just having them, giving them a, an assignment, and it, I really just told them it didn't count for anything, but I wanted them to all send me an email at, over the weekend, and it was what I had assigned them to do was to explain the biofilm process and, you know, what happens. Just, I said, sit your roommate down, your parent, your sibling, and explain to them how the bacteria colonization works if they decide to stop brushing their teeth and take them through all those stages. So having them try to teach someone else, I said, how did you feel about the information at that point? And I encourage them to have their notes out so that they feel like they are kind of the expert, but they all really retained and understood the information more when I when they explained it to someone. As someone who employs all of the people that you're educating after they come out, that is what I'm looking for, just so you are all on the same page. During the recruiting process, during the interview process, I'm asking the questions, trying to not pinpoint, do you know what Perio is, right? right? Tell me more about what you learned. Tell me how you like to learn. Tell me the things that you'd love to explain to a patient, what you'd love to teach to a patient. Uh, Tell me the process of, tell me the the thoughts and feelings of, because I need them to understand that we are in a battle with this disease that is not localized to the mouth at all, right? And so when you're engaging the students the way you all are, it makes a world of difference for the people that I am hiring and the people I'll pay more money to hire. I think that those soft skills are so underappreciated sometimes. I think those soft skills of you know communication, it's not just knowing the facts, it's how you're going to present those facts to the patient in a way that they understand. For sure. So let's move on to this next question. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in our little questions. How could students study more effectively for your courses? I'm going to piggyback on what you all have been talking about. I have them... I tell them they need to meet in groups of um, three to four. They each need to pick a chapter and they're going to teach their group about that chapter and how it impacts clinical work. And I also make them do, well, I make them encourage them (laughs) to (laughs) actually come up with a case study that actually, you know, employs all of that information. And so, you know, they tend not to do that. Maybe on the first exam, they see their score is not what they have expected in the past. And so then usually by um, exam two, they do that and they tend to do a lot better. If they teach someone else that and they don't think they can do it on Zoom, I'm like, you guys are learning on Zoom, aren't you? You're doing it. (laughs) One thing I really worked with students on is we have a notebook that I have created for the class where they kind of can fill in some key points, but I really encourage them to do some outlining of their chapters and actually putting pen to paper to get some of those concepts down. And um, they usually work as a group pretty well to make their own um, Quizlet that they kind of pass around, or sometimes they get it from the class prior to them and then they modify it. And I myself help with different review things by I often put together cahoots for the students, which is online. I use the free version and we usually play a review game, which gets quite competitive. If we can be in person, I usually have some candy that we throw out for correct answers. 
but I did an informal survey of the students today to ask them what their favorite thing was. And uh, the Cahoots and the Quizlet Lives that we do are their their favorite things. Oh, nice. Yeah, I can definitely say that the students love Quizlet Live and Kahoot. To add to what Amanda was saying, I think that she said earlier that students, they don't learn like we did. And I'm a millennial too, barely, but I am. <laughs> but she said that they don't take to the lecture really well, right? So I actually use a lot of active learning in my classroom. And I have to say, it's kind of found me a little bit by surprise because students do not love active learning as much as they say they do. And the reason I think that is, is because it's difficult. They are learning to apply the information and they're used to kind of being in more of a passive situation in class. But in this this way, they're they're forced to almost know it when they come to class. And then after they apply it, they have actually learned in a higher level. of. So, yeah, I think that they they don't like it. But my advice to them would to be to stay the course and trust the process, because I always have senior students that come back to me and I teach two uh, perio courses. I teach a junior and a senior course and they always come back to me and they always thank me for doing that to them because I, they know that they they it made them learn a lot better. I totally agree with what Eva said. You know, it's important now to incorporate things for each type of learner and to help them study, I'm making an assignment for them to take the VARC questionnaire and learn about how do they learn the best way and then give them tips to study based on that. Because not every student learns the same way. When we were in school, I had to read the book, take my notes and pass a test. We didn't have these cool projects and you know multimedia projects. We weren't doing this. So I think like Eva said, trusting the process and really just committing and knowing you're going to get through it. And we are on your side. The educators are on your side because we can't be successful if they are not successful. See, we would have made Andrew love Perio. Exactly. Look, you could have. If my brain would have been open enough to it. That's the other thing, too. Is like, I'm not, I'm not discounting my educators. I think they're probably phenomenal educators. My brain wasn't as uh, amenable as it is now. I, you know, I was just thinking, you know, Mr. Cout, which I know you guys don't know who Mr. Cout is, but he was my seventh grade teacher. He would, I think, have a another heart attack. He had a heart attack when we were um, in school. I don't know if we gave it to him, but whatever. So I, I think with all the things that you guys are talking about, he was a, all right on the chalkboard and we're going to use our projector. You guys remember that projector? With We thought it was really cool at the time because we had those dry erase Sharpies or whatever, and he would go over all of his math and um, he would be just blown away by the ways that are out there to help somebody learn a thing. So anyways, I'm just, I love it. Okay. Last question. Last question. Let's make it a doozy. No, this, I'm not going to get you guys in trouble with everyone else, but I do actually want to know without throwing your fellow educators under the bus, what are some things that you think that maybe the educator community could improve on or, or maybe not necessarily even that if that's too hard hitting, but things that you found that have been very helpful for, helpful for you as you evolve that you think that other people in the, as an educator level like you could uh, benefit from? Whoa, hands, okay. Amanda. So Andrew, you just use the word amenable, right? Education is about being open-minded. We have to be open to all of the new learning theories and activities and all of these things we can put into practice because at the end of the day healthcare is always evolving we can wake up tomorrow and there can be another major discovery so if we're not open to those things then we aren't going to be able to provide the best for our students so just being open-minded i would say that for when I first began in education about five, six years ago, I felt like people didn't want to share what they were doing or what they were using. And I feel that a little bit COVID has gotten us over that. And we realized we as educators all need to work together. Just on this call, I realized that I had a call with Amanda, I believe, for student RDH. And I think we talked on the phone. And I realized that Eva, her assignment of the mixed media, I adapted that assignment. She had posted on a discussion board on Facebook and um, I adapted that and my class is doing it 
using um, Vengage and Padlet, which are online infographic and, and things that they can do it online. So I think that the more that we share information, I know that my the person in the office next to me shared how to convert tests and load them onto Blackboard. And then I shared that with people I used to work with. And I mean, one of the instructors sent me a, a text and she said, I would have just wasted three hours typing this exam into Blackboard. And I just did a 150 question exam in like 15 minutes with the online tools that I referred to her. So I just really think that the kind of getting over ourselves and learning to to share because we all have the same goal. Yeah, and I think that that also transcends to the students too. You know, faculty, I see too often in um, online forum posts, students that complain about, you know, the old horrible faculty member that's just mean and out to get them. And we really have to change that culture, especially in pre-professional programs. It's just, it's ridiculous. Like we have got to do better in that regard. They are our future colleagues, they are future professionals, and we have to treat them uh, with the respect that they deserve. That doesn't mean that our standard has to be lower. We can still hold them accountable and to that bar, but the respect, it has to be there. Lisa, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think collaborative is definitely there. Um, we have an educators meeting in Washington State and just meeting and talking to other educators. I'm like, oh, and I have that, and they're like, of course, that's why we're talking about that. So, you know, I've learned so much from other people and just, you know, I don't know everything and I tend to be more creative and probably out there than some other instructors. And so I think, you know, you know, other instructors are like, I don't feel, and I'm like, yeah, you know what? At the end of the day, if everyone's alive, it's a great day. So try it, you know? You have to have confidence in yourself or it comes across as you don't know what you're doing to the students. And, you know, I'm like, hey, if this is not working, let's just try it again. Again, no one's dead at the end of the day. Great day. I want to thank you all so very much for making time. And again, on such short notice, I think that this has been just phenomenal. One of my favorite roundtables ever for a topic that I don't, I can't say that I love. So thank you so much for making it wonderful, enjoyable. I learned something surprisingly too. Oh my gosh. And I'm sure everyone else did as well. I hope you all have a good night. Thank you. Well, another great week, another great episode. We thank you all so much for listening each week. If you haven't already hit that subscribe button, whatever podcasting app you're using. Also, just a reminder, our guests are so fantastic that they love when you reach out. They love when you interact with them on social media and you can interact with us on social media as well at Instagram or Facebook. We're also on LinkedIn. You can find us at A Tale of Two Hygienists. You can also go to our website at taleofthygenist.com and we would love for you to go there and subscribe for our newsletter. We have lots of stuff on our website. We have a learning center. You can search for any episode. This is an easy place for you to find the links for our CE uh, courses and take the test. Um, there's just so much more there. So head over to a tale of two .com, And if you want, you can also send us an email. I'm Michelle at a tale of two hygienist with an S.com. And then there's Andrew, who is Andrew at a tale of two hygienist with an S.com. And we just want to say thank you so much. If you love this episode and you're loving the podcast, we would love for you to subscribe and leave us a review and, you know, five star, go ahead and do it. Five star, just hit that five star and then leave us a review. We really appreciate it. We love reading them. It fuels our fire and we just appreciate you guys so much. Um, I think that's it, Andrew. Anything else? Nope. That's it. Have a good week, everybody. Bye y'all. <laughs>